Welcome to the Modern Law Library. I'm your host, Lee Rawls, and today I'm joined by Katherine James, author of the book, Harvesting Witnesses Stories, How to Get Your Client the Second Best Life in the World by Maximizing Human Damages. Katherine, thanks so much for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me, Lee. So can you tell my listeners a little bit about yourself, your background, and how you came to write this book? Absolutely. I am from the theater. I'm a classically trained repertory actress, director, writer, producer, and have been in theater since I was five years old. And lo about the time I was 25, getting my master's degree at the American Conservatory Theater, a wonderful mentor of mine, Ed Hastings, PhD from Yale, pulled jury duty and came back to those of us in the theater just absolutely baffled and having had this horrible experience in a trial. And by golly, all of the things that he told us about why it was so difficult, every single thing he brought up, I realized I had a solution for. And it was all from the theater. It was like a Roadrunner cartoon light bulbs going off over my head. And it started out then when I was 25 and knew everything. And fast forward all these years later, starting out with training lawyers and getting them to be more effective communicators just in the courtroom. Now, I discovered along the pathway as they began to bring their witnesses to me that working with witnesses, or as we would say in the theater, non-pros, non-professionals, working with those people is maybe more uh, like a calling, like a life's calling. So I've dealt with all kinds of witnesses in all kinds of cases. And harvesting witnesses' stories comes from my work with plaintiff's lawyers And actually, some business cases are thrown in there as well. And I just love working with witnesses. And I think that, and I hope that this legacy book of mine gives every lawyer who reads it and every non-lawyer who reads it an insight into, into themselves and into the people with whom they communicate. So I'm sure that any attorney who's listening to this has read any number of you know, textbooks, workbooks, et cetera. So I wanted to talk about the way you structured the book because it sucked me in. Uh, You got me. Could you talk a little bit about the fashion in which you wrote this book and how you intend for people to be able to use it? I wanted very much for people to be able to use this book flipping back and forth between the stories, the tales, and I call them tales because within each of those stories, there appear to be techniques that I've developed along the way for how to deal with all kinds of problems, issues, challenges that witnesses have, and therefore that lawyers have with those witnesses. Then the part of it is called techniques. And as I started visualizing the book, I, I came across a wonderful book that had uh, giant margins in the side so people can take notes and that had little pullouts so that people could see, oh, this technique is what's associated with this particular part of this tale and how she solved this problem. And you can then flip all the way back You could think of it as an appendix, techniques, if you wanted to, but you flip back to techniques and you can think, oh my gosh, uh, let me get a hold of that. Like, for example, if you're reading the chapter about people who have brain damage, for example, and you come across the repeating exercise, that I use the repeating exercise for that, then there's a little... Uh, a little symbol that shows you, oh, the repeating exercise, where do I find that? And then you go to the end of the book and you can read the repeating exercise, if you like, if you're that kind of person. You may be the kind of person who likes to come from the very beginning and read straight through to the end. There are lots of people like that. You can do that also. And then, of course, there are people who have an emergency right now. I have an emergency right now. There is a person I am staring at in my office who is completely freaking me out. How am I going to deal with this problem? So you should be able to look through the table of contents or flip through the chapters and go, oh my gosh, this is going to help me. This is going to help me. So I call those people like grazers. 
you know, you know what, you know what kind of learner you are. So I wanted to make the book so that anyone at whatever kind of, uh, and in whatever kind of way they like to learn, it would be accessible to them. And really, I would say as a reader, what it reminded me of, you know, I, both my parents were attorneys. And so I grew up around attorneys and, and listening to them speak. This to me feels like you are able by going to one of the tales to hear from your senior litigation partner say, oh gosh, yeah, you know what your situation reminds me of this time when, and then they tell you the story and then they can extrapolate the lesson for you. And that to me is always a more memorable way to integrate information into my life is you tell me a story about it. Absolutely. Storytelling is huge for us as a species, Lee. It's how we pass on information to one another. I think that the expression war stories sometimes gets a bad rap amongst attorneys because someone might be droning on and on about their own lives. But um, that is how we pass on information, isn't it? From one human being to the next is storytelling. And when you say war stories, I'm immediately reminded of the chapter, The Witness Who Talks Too Much. (laughs) Could you use that as an example of one of the stories you told and then the lessons you illustrated through that story? Oh, my gosh. This was, you know, a lot of lawyers go, oh, you know, I say, well, what's the problem? They go, oh, the guy just talks too much. The guy just talks too much. And I always think to myself, well, we have to figure out why. Why does this person talk too much? Because unless you know the why behind how they talk too much, you're never going to be able to fix that person. It's not enough to go, don't talk so much, don't talk so much. That works for some people, but you might have noticed if you're in a journey out there, it kind of doesn't work for everyone. So this particular witness who I just fell in love with, he was just delighted at every single thing that came out of his mouth. And he would answer when we were in mock examination, I have a series of questions in deposition for a witness to ask themselves uh, after opposing counsel, the the other side's lawyer asks them the question. They, They have to sort of go through a series of questions. And the first question is, do I understand that question? And instead of thinking to himself, do I understand the question? He would say out loud, ah, you know, I actually, I don't understand what you're saying to me. Can you believe that? You'd think I could understand that because it's just in plain English. But actually, I mean, he was like amazing. I don't remember the answer to that. Can you believe that? You'd think this would be important enough to me. So it turns out that this wonderful man had been in a concentration camp. He was a Holocaust survivor. And he was just so freaking happy to be alive that, and his delight in communication was extraordinary. He was just such a beautiful, beautiful man. So I said to him, I looked at him and I said, "Um, sweetheart, did you talk this much to the Nazis when they would ask you a question? And he said, and his little, his eyes got big. He was so excited. He said, No, he was delighted at the conversation, if you can believe that, but he was. I said, okay, so here's what we're going to do. So I took the bad lawyer hat. I have these hats I've developed for witness preparation, bad lawyer and good lawyer uh, for for when you're doing mock examination. And we took a a little post-it note, you know, a little yellow post-it note, and I drew a swastika on it and I put it on the bad lawyer hat. And I said, every time this bad lawyer, the other side's lawyer asks you a question, it's a Nazi, okay? And talk to that person like you talk to the Nazis. He was amazing. He completely shut up. He answered very, very briefly as he did with the Nazis. How else did he survive, you know? It was amazing. And the true moral of that story that I will never forget is he said to me, oh, Catherine, you know, you gave me something because I really, um, I know now how I defeated the Nazis. You've helped me figure out how to get those bastards. And he just had the best time at his deposition. 
And he really felt in some way he had actually gotten the Nazis. It was kind of cool. And that's only one of the, you know, more than two dozen stories that's in your book. So yeah, just giving giving listeners a little taste of that. I would also like people to kind of understand what the tools and techniques section of the book is like. Would you mind reading a passage that will help my listeners get a feel for the book? Oh, I'd love to. This is from chapter 29, and it's called Why Rehearsal? And the subtitle of this chapter is Role Playing, the Key to Preparation. Stage one, the read through. In the theater, the actors and production team gather around a big table or in a circle. The play is read out loud for the first time by this group of people. Some parts are glorious. Some parts fall flat. Some parts everyone realizes must be cut before the next rehearsal. Most actors feel hollow, unemotional, and disconnected during the first read-through. But they love getting a feeling for the whole play and what it is going to be like someday in front of an audience. A lawyer who doesn't even meet with a witness before the witness is deposed, puts on the read-through in front of opposing counsel and on the record as the deposition. The witness has no idea what to do and is just trying not to lose the place in the script. It is a nightmare for the witness. But that's okay, because the lawyer will blame the witness for the bad testimony that he didn't know was coming out of the witness's mouth. Stage two, the blocking rehearsal. In the theater, this is the first time the play is put on its feet and the actors are given direction as to where to stand and when to sit and where to walk. It is horribly stiff and awkward. There is no emotion or connection with the material. Even if the scene calls for a kiss, the actors will be so busy writing down where they are supposed to be exactly when the kiss takes place that they won't even take time out to smooch. The actors don't even make eye contact with one another. A lawyer who doesn't rehearse at all with the witness but merely lectures to them anywhere from 20 minutes to two weeks before putting the witness on the stand, puts the blocking rehearsal on in front of opposing counsel and on the record. The witness has been told what to do, but doesn't know how to do it. This is yet another nightmare for the witness, but not for the lawyer, who blames the witness for lousy testimony. Stage three, the first run through off book. In the theater, this is the first time the actors put their scripts down and try to do all that blocking and remember their words at the same time. Once in a while, the magic is there, but most of the time it feels like swimming through molasses. It is the time when most actors think, why did I ever want to do this with my life? Am I insane? In the witness preparation process, this is the point where the witness is still trying to do a balancing act with the forms. And the forms, by the way, are in chapter 32, uh, a step-by-step -step guide to witness preparation and mock examination. It is still a phase at which almost all witnesses plead to go through it one more time. A lawyer who primarily lectures the witness and then does little bits and pieces of rehearsal on a few points before the deposition and calls that preparation, puts the first run through off book on in front of opposing counsel and on the record. More bad testimony that the lawyer can blame on the witness. Stage four, the dress rehearsal. In the theater, this is the last rehearsal before you let an audience see you. It is always a magic time. The emotional life of the play is right on target. The lines are free and wonderful. The blocking is perfect. It is as if the play, which is a living thing, is finally born. In the witness preparation process, this is where the witness is finally and totally in the zone of deposition. It is a magic and awesome time. Full preparation. The lawyer who allows this whole rehearsal process to take place 
sleeps well the night before this witness gets deposed or takes the stand. The lawyer knows that tomorrow, all the hard work is going to pay off and there will be a deposition that will be worthy of settlement and tight enough for cross-examination at trial, if need be. And if trial is tomorrow, the lawyer rests assured that the witness is truly ready for the final test of any case. Well, thank you so much for reading that. I, I also like the fact that in a number of places you bring up how frustrating lawyers find it frequently dealing with witnesses and, and how it's easy to see even your own witness as something of an aggravation if there if there isn't a good connection. Can you talk about what your advice is to attorneys who just feel like they're not clicking with this witness, they don't understand why this person doesn't seem to be getting it, and just how you can have a productive relationship with your witnesses from jump? Well, the very first principle, and it's the basis of everything that I do, is the witness is more important than you are. That's very difficult because lawyers are scary, smart people. And you know this, Lee, because you were raised by two of them. <laughs> They're thinking 12 steps down the road and they've got everything worked out and their minds are full of language and they've got it and it is perfect somewhere in their minds. However, the other person, the person in front of them is the most important person. It's a principle that you learn as a young actor in scenes, because of course, young actors, what are we thinking about? Me, my lines, my emotion, my, how do I feel? You know, we're all thinking about ourselves. And actually one of the first things that you learn is that the other person on stage is more important than you are. And that's the first and foremost principle. So that's from the acting world. Then there are two other ways in which you can completely miss your witness. So if we, if we step aside from the acting world, the next world that I would go to is uh, neuro-linguistic programming. Well, that sounds intimidating. Doesn't it though, NLP? It's pretty simple, uh, at least the way I use it. It's actually, it can be very, very complicated, of course, but I'm a, I'm a simple person. I have to figure out who's this lawyer and who's this witness and how are they not co uh, connecting? So one of the easiest ways they're not connecting is... One of them will be visual, and the other one will be auditory or kinesthetic. By that, I mean a lawyer will say, for example, well, when you walked into the room, what did you see first? Now, a person who is not visual, that is, if I say to you, what is the letter in the alphabet just before R, a visual person will be looking up and trying to see the letters of the alphabet, maybe in their kindergarten room. Obviously, if you're me, you're also singing the song, sadly. But you're, you're trying to see those letters. An auditory person is listening. They get things through sound. And a kinesthetic person gets things through touch. So if a lawyer says, what's the first thing you saw when you went in the room? That's, the, that's what the lawyer likes. The lawyer likes visual things, uh, that particular lawyer. And the witness who is auditory, the first thing they did wasn't, they didn't see something, they heard something. So they already think that they messed up. And they, they're starting to think, oh, I'm never, gonna, I'm never gonna be able to talk to this guy. Or the kinesthetic people who are a very small percentage of people, the people who are touch, literally touchy-feely, the first thing they did when they went in that room was they felt, they felt the air or you know, they felt how cold it was, the temperature. So again, the lawyer is going to either be visual, auditory, or kinesthetic, and so is the witness. So in order to understand if this person is visual, I need to speak to them in visual terms, even if I am auditory or kinesthetic. It's really an interesting way in which people miss one another all the time. And lawyers have to figure it out really fast and have to not constantly be involved with the, their own way of process. It's processing, actually. So like I'm very visual. So I'll say C, C, C eight million times and I'll have to double down with an auditory person and say, 
so you heard, so you heard, you know, it's, it's, we all have our own proclivities that we, it's like a bias that we go toward that we have to work on that. Lawyers have to work on that. And finally, there's another world and that's the world of education. Bernice McCarthy, who is a brilliant educator who developed the format system of learning. That's a system that I've adapted for lawyers and witnesses. So all human beings basically fall into four different learning styles. And if a lawyer and a witness have two different learning styles, they're going to clash. They're either going to clash or it's just not going to happen. Like if you think about the number of people that you know, some of them, you match them and they get you right away and you get them right away. And another, you know, bunch of people, you kind of can figure it out together. And then there's a group of people that you just simply miss all the time. It's just crazy. And often that has to do with learning styles. So I've divided, so the world is divided into four kinds of learners. And therefore, if you are one kind of learner, like for example, if your basic question is, how does this work? You know, how many, you say to a witness, um, so what, what questions do you have about having your deposition taken? And they say, well, you know, I've never done this before. So I'm wondering like, how does it work? I mean, is the room going to look like this? You know, what's the agenda? Now, if you are a person whose basic and question is also, how does it work? You go, oh, thank God we're home free. However, if your basic question is why, why is this important? Why is this an important thing? When, and when they say something like, what's the agenda? You think, are you kidding me? This is not a meaningful thing to say. So again, you're going to be missing them. And it's, it's all in the book and ways to figure this out about other people. But that's where I, those are the three places I start. First, witness more important to you. Second, wait a minute, am I visual? And this person is touchy-feely. And the third thing is, uh uh-oh, I've got a what-if person. I've got a wild creative on my hands. I got to figure out how to talk to this person so they understand me. This book was specifically written for plaintiff's attorneys in in tort cases and talking about, you know, damages. But it's that way that you frame the issue that I think makes this book applicable to way more people because you can have these same kinds of misunderstandings with any coworker person in your life. And that, you know, it really did make me stop and, and kind of think about that. Could you discuss that? Is that an intentional thing? Uh, have you found that once you explain these witness techniques to attorneys that they then can apply them in other ways in their life? Well, let me tell you a wonderful story that I heard recently. I have a, I have a fabulous client slash colleague slash friend. He has a little boy who plays baseball and he's a manager of the baseball team. And he's his, uh, one of the team members and this team member's father. So we're talking about, you know, a guy in his 40s and somebody who is 12, uh, father and son. Every day the, that there was a game, the kid would say to his father the night before, he would say, Dad, how long is it going to take to get to the game? How long is it going to take to get to the game? And the father was so angry over this question. He said to, he said to my friend, he said, I don't want to play anymore. I'm going to pull him from the team. He doesn't care. He just, how long is it going to take there? I mean, it's ridiculous that he asked that question over and over again. He clearly doesn't care about the game. And my friend Scott said, well, did you ask him why he wants to know? And the father of the kid who was about ready to be pulled from the team says, no, I never did. And Scott says, well, ask him next time and let's just give him another chance. So he asks the kid, well, why do you want to know? And he says, oh, dad, I need to know because I need to know when I need to set my alarm so that I can be ready and all ready and and ready to go and breakfast it up and have my uniform on and be in the car. Oh, no, this poor little planner. (laughs) (laughs) He just needed to know all the steps. Yes. Isn't that just beautiful? And the father came to the, and he was crying. And he said to my, my friend, how, how did you know that? And he said, well, my, my friend, Catherine James wrote this book. And the guy said, what is it? What is it? So that father has the book, has read the book and is telling everybody about the book and what a difference it's made for him in his personal life. I love that. That is amazing. 
One of the other things I really liked, you have a lot of phrases in the book that stuck with me, but one of them was always and nevers. <laughs> so, so could you talk a little bit about the always and nevers and, and how it's kind of a pitfall for a lot of attorneys? Well, first I have to say that I love lawyers so much. I gave birth to one. I know you embryonically. You hold no mystery for me. So lawyers have a lot of things that are out of control in their lives. When I say to somebody, when when somebody says to me, oh, I know how to fix that. Let me tell you, I always, 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 always do this. Or I never, 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 never do that. Or they'll say to a witness, here's what you need to do. Always, 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 always. Or they'll say to them, never, 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 never do the never, 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 never. And they're just desperately trying to have some control over a situation. Well, the thing about people is, in case you haven't noticed this, is people are messy. You got to get rid of your own always and nevers to find the unique solution to this human being who's in front of you. They might not fit into your always, always, always pattern or your never, never, never pattern. And you have to be willing to open yourself up to the possibility of, oh, here's a surprise. This person actually learns best this way. Or, you know what, this never, I got to tell you, I'm wrong with this never. This guy, this guy has to have this. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to amend my wonderful uh, list of my always and my nevers. That also brings me to basically the word choice for the title in the book. I I really loved and thought illustrated a point you're trying to make in the book, harvesting witnesses' stories. I think that it's easy as an attorney with a lot on your plate to look at witness prep and finding out the stories in someone's life as almost, okay, well, I ticked this box, I ticked this box, we're done. And you really take a different attitude towards it. Could you talk a little bit about the importance of stories and why lawyers should be taking this process so seriously? Story is everything. Story is all. It's it's um, why the theater plus the law, because the basically they're two storytelling mediums. So I get to tell stories in my art. I get to tell stories in my life. So Albert Einstein, when asked, why was he a genius, said, oh, I'm not a genius. It's just that when somebody tells me, look for a needle in a haystack, I would look until I found all possibilities of all needles. Most people just stop when they find their first needle. So I liken that to what lawyers often do with stories. And stories are such glorious things. And there are stories behind stories. For example, if you say to me, uh, when did you meet your husband? And I say, oh, I met him in graduate school. And you go, okay. And then you move on instead of saying, well, tell me about that. Tell me about that story. You're never going to find the glorious story of how I met Alan Blumenfeld. Or in a business case. If you say, well, well, uh, so when did you first start your business? I first started my business in 1969. Box check. Ding. Well, why did you start that business? What was it about that business? Boom. Or why did you decide to do that with your life? Boom. So you get a first story and behind that are more and more and more stories. And the more open-ended you can be, the less judgmental with your questioning you can be, the more glorious and bigger and more wonderful the stories. So I know right now, Lee, that you were raised by two lawyers. And I would, you know, if I were preparing you as a witness, I'd say, what was that like? And you would give me something and it would be a story. And if it wasn't a story, I'd say, well, tell me about that. So it's just little ways in which lawyers can unlock those stories. And that is some beneath all those stories as you harvest them. And I literally think of it as going down in the dirt and picking up the story, right? Behind all those stories, there will be another story. And ultimately, there will be an amazing story. And that might be the story you want to cherry pick and use. 
And once you tell them all stories are equal and I accept all your stories and all your stories are just fine to tell, you will be amazed at what comes out of them. It's just, and it is the basis of what you need to win this case always. And even on the reverse side, I mean, the story you start out with in your book, an attorney had really made an assumption about this family who just lost the patriarch, essentially, and just wasn't getting anything out of this family, couldn't understand why trial's coming up, and he brings you in. Could you talk a little bit about that situation? Oh, yeah. This is one of those things. Oh, my gosh. You know, you think, oh, the damages are amazing in this case. You know, this whole family was totally traumatized and totally freaked out. And the liability is perfect. I mean, this the place where this guy had worked, clearly negligent, had killed him. He was really and sincerely dead because they were they had done bad acts, right? So you have the perfect liability and perfect damages. So the lawyer is walking in with me. He's so excited. He says, I just need a few stories, a few illustrations, and I can't get them to talk to me about the guy. So I start out talking about, we're going to be talking about your dad. And everybody kind of hushes up, the widow, the grown children just get quiet. And and I thought, oh, okay, that's all right. And I say, well, this is going to be like a wake. We're going to talk. We're going to tell all the stories about him. (laughs) And one of the kids goes, stories or the truth? (laughs) And I said, well, stories that are the truth. I mean, I still didn't get it myself. Well, stories that are the truth, true stories, true stories. And each story as it unfolded was more horrifying than the last about this guy. I mean, I tell you my favorite one still, Lee, I will never forget this one, is when one of the kids says, do you remember that time dad hit me upside the head with a boiling pan of corn and I had school pictures the next day? Oh, I mean, no. every story was worse than the last one about this clearly abusive, sadistic, horrifying, psychotic, sociopathic man who had tortured these people for their entire lives. And I was laughing and encouraging more stories and the lawyers laughing and we're encouraging all these stories because the reality is, is there was no causation in this case. Actually, the best thing that that corporation ever did for this family was kill that horrible man I think personally you know it was pretty it was pretty remarkable so you know and they were all happy and they're waving goodbye to us at the door I mean they were just so relieved and happy it was kind of a a beautiful release for everyone I think I love that you were able to bring a lightness to the family that wasn't there when you arrived I know. Isn't it? Is stories and the truth. What a remarkable combination. Oh, that's right. That's what the law is about. It's amazing. So, of course, he figured out that he had to, he had to settle that case. <laughs> oh, it was wonderful. So, there are people who can easily communicate their stories to the jury that you're going to face. And then there are people who are going to be challenged with that whether it's because this isn't their native language or they're a child or they've suffered some injury that has caused cognitive damages. What are some of the things that lawyers need to keep in mind when they're dealing with a witness who's going to have additional challenges communicating to the jury? Well, you have to be honest with yourself about what the challenge is and not try to put too much on their plate in the wrong kind of a way. Like, for example, you talk about a child. I often uh, use a technique called the letter with the child. I'm finding actually I'm using the letter more and more with lots of people. And that's um, the, the child writes a letter to the parent who is dead, usually when I meet the child or severely changed and altered in some way. And so the child gets to say, dear dad, I miss you and gets to say all the things they miss. Or if they're a very young child, they get to draw pictures 
and tell you the stories behind those pictures. Children are wonderful human beings. The problem is, is that they're not all raised exactly the same. They're all raised by, uh, by parents like me, <laughs> like all of us are uh, with all of our faults and, and, and all of the ways in which we do a good job. And sometimes you're dealing with a kid with a parent who hasn't done a good job with the grief and hasn't done a good job with helping them out. And you may be the very first person they are talking to about their loss. So you have to be aware of so many things when dealing with a kid. With people for whom English is not their first language or might even be their second language or might not be their language at all, you know, it's remarkable how many lawyers shy away from using a translator, even just using a translator during preparation. You might not even be using the translator during the deposition itself, sometimes not during the trial, but you have to give people a break because it's not just English. They don't speak legal English. You speak it. You love that language. Uh, well, they made the contract in English. They should be able to testify in English. Not really. They, they, you're asking them to understand legal English, which is completely different from, you know, let's, I'm going to give you 27,000 widgets for uh, $1.5 million. I mean, it's, it's a completely different way of speaking. So using a translator, at least at the beginning in, in, in um, preparation, gigantic, gigantic for people. And then people with cognitive problems, oof, Here's the biggest issue for me, and you have to remember, I do love you guys, I love lawyers, but lawyers try to give responsibility to people with cognitive issues. I don't know why, you know, like there'll be this piece of the case that they think is vital that the witness has to say, well, you know, the part where the guy doesn't remember anything because he was smashed in the head, <laughs> he doesn't remember that. He can't possibly remember that part. So why, are you, why do you think that he has to carry the water on that or she absolutely has to talk about that? It's kind of sad how lawyers love, uh, oh my gosh, this guy is so damaged and I want to help him so much. And don't forget this part. You have to remember to say this. I mean, it's, it just, it's, it's sad and wonderful. But I have something I use called the repeating exercise. And I just, oh, the other day, I just had such a sad, sad case where again, the lawyer was saying, well, I want him to remember this part and that part. And I'm like, boyfriend, he cannot remember. He can't remember anything. And I, I, had, I had the witness repeat the question. You know, what is your name? What is my name? My name is, right? So what day of the week was that? What day, uh, what day of the, what, what, he couldn't, he couldn't get past what day of. It just, oh my God, breaks your heart, right? So he's going to be using that repeating exercise in the deposition room because I got to tell you, the other side, what do they need to know? They need to know that this guy is actually brain damaged which is very terrifying for most lawyers, you know, because lawyers love their big, beautiful brains, don't you? They do indeed. And that really also makes me think about the subtitle of the book, because this, this really is what it's all about for these witnesses and these plaintiffs in these cases, these very sad cases. How to get your client the second best life in the world by maximizing human damages. The second best life in the world I, I do like that as a framing. Can you talk a little bit about what that means to you, what you think lawyers should be keeping in mind as they do this witness prep? Well, the reality is, is they had the first best life in the world. They had the first best life in the world. So all we're ever going to get for them is the second best life in the world. And it comes from, of course, a real life story, a real life case of mine. I never forget her, a young woman named Janie in her 30s in a wheelchair with two little boys and a husband. And I said, oh, well, Janie, what do you want from this case or something? I don't even remember what my question was. 
And I don't know what I thought she was going to say, but she looked right at me and she said, Miss Catherine, which is my name in the South, by the way, Miss Catherine, Miss Catherine, you know, I know that I can never get the first life, the first best life in the world again. I had that. That's gone. But I right now have like the fourth best life in the world. And my sons and my husband, you know, this is hard times and we can't deal with this anymore. And all I really want is the second best life in the world. And I think that what stands between me and the second best life in the world is this lawsuit. And you know what? She was right. She was absolutely right. So that's what we're working for every single time is the second best life in the world. Well, Catherine, thank you so much for joining us on this episode of the Modern Law Library and for hopefully helping my listeners who are in this line of work uh, achieve that for their clients. Well, thank you, Lee. You are awesome. This was way too much fun for me. What a wonderful, wonderful interviewer you are. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you. And uh, I hope that you, the listeners, enjoyed this as well. If you did, please rate, review, and subscribe on your favorite podcast listening service.